Hello, I'm Francis Suni and welcome back to Diplomata. In this episode, I'll meet a UN diplomat with enormous experience in development, especially development in the underdeveloped countries. He is currently leading the United Nations Development Program in Timor-Leste. Claudio Providas was appointed as UNDP Country Director in Timor-Leste in July 2015. Prior to this appointment, Claudio served as UNDP's Deputy Representative in Bolivia, Ecuador, Trinidad Tobago and Suriname. Claudio started his career in the UN as a UNV in Mozambique, on UMOS, from 1993 to 1995 in a humanitarian post-conflict setting, managing one of the demobilization and reintegration camps located in Kaya Beira. Claudio holds a Master Spécialiste en Gestion or Specialized Master in Management from EAP or École des Affaires de Paris, France. He graduated from the Universidad de la República, Facultad de Humanidades y Ciencias in Montevideo, Uruguay. He speaks English, French, Spanish and Portuguese. Thank you very much for agreeing to be part of uh, this program. Uh, to start the conversation, could you please tell me your background, your history, uh, and your involvement with the UN? Well, I, I was, um, I'm Uruguayan, I was doing some studies actually in, in France, in, in, in Europe, in uh, 93 when I had sent an application more than a year before to the UN, to UNV, to the United Nations Volunteers, uh, while I was finishing uh, university. And one uh, cold rainy night, out of the blue, I got a phone call. At that time, the, the volunteers uh, headquarters was in Geneva, asking me if I wanted to go to Mozambique. I remember it was cold, it was damp, it was six or seven in the evening, it was a winter already, night time, I was completely lost and I started looking a little bit into it and since I was uh, finishing uh, my, my, my studies uh, I decided why not and why don't give it a, a try and the proposal was to go for a few months I remember this told me it was five six months to support the disarmament the demobilization the reintegration process in Mozambique just after the peace agreement the peace accord was signed in 1993 um, I thought this was going to be a five, six year assignment, uh, five, six months assignment and, uh, you know, 20 years later, he, here, here I am. So um, um, then after, after Mozambique, I ended up staying a little more than a year and a half. They asked me to go to New York, I was in the UN Secretariat and then um, I moved on to UNDP. And that's when I started my career in uh, 96 in, uh, with uh, UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. Moving from France to, to Mozambique must have been such a, a big transition for you. But before we, we talk about more about that, that, that move, could you please tell me a little bit about your education, your background in and your studies? Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I'm born in Europe, in Spain, actually, but I grew up in Brussels, and that's where I went to primary school. And then uh, we moved to Uruguay. My mother's Uruguayan, and I'm also uh, Uruguayan. And that's where I went to, to uh, high school and uh, university. At that time, there was only a public uh, university, and I studied, actually, biological science, hydrobiology, and uh, oceanography. Um, while I was uh, finishing my studies, I did some research um, in an oceanographic uh, institute and then I decided to change CAP. Actually one of the things I always wanted to do was uh, management and business administration. At that time the option was not available in this uh, small country. Uh, so I moved back to Europe and, and I did uh, management. Uh, and that's uh, where then I focused my, the, the bulk of my work uh, with, a, with the UN at the beginning. What motivated you to apply for a UN volunteer uh, work? Well, at the beginning, uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, I was young. I remember I, w I lived in a country actually that had some similarities with Timor-Leste. That's Uruguay. I was surrounded by sea. I always had a passion for the sea and for the environment. 
I, I remember being a kid and, and uh, watching Cousteau. Cousteau was a French oceanographer. His son now is still alive and working, and talking about you know the oceans and, and, and biodiversity. And um, then I start uh, finding out what the UN was doing in the environment. And I got in touch to learn a little bit about UNDP, the environment program, uh, fisheries, uh, marine conservation. And while I was working in, in Uruguay part-time in, in this research institution, this oceanographic research institution, I says, why not and give it a try? And at that time, I sent my, my, my application looking at uh, potentially after I was finishing my studies, continuing my work in uh, environment and particularly in oceanography uh, with the UN. Were One, you expecting to go to Mozambique at the time? No, it was not at all in my, in my radar, but then I, I started getting informed and, and I took it on as a challenge and I, and I was really at the time looking uh, for, for, for to, to start uh, my, my professional career. So it was more out of um, curiosity I got, of course, in uh, terms of reference for a job description, and, and I was intrigued by it. I researched a little bit about the, the, the role which was actually uh, organizing one of the, at that time, 49 uh, UN camps, um, and it was a mix of things. There was reintegration activity, supporting the demobilization process. It says, why not? I think I can do this. And, but it was really like a trial uh, thing, and it says, and if not, I will come back and try to get back on, 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 on track with my life. But actually, I, I found it uh, fascinating, very challenging. At the beginning, of course, moving from a city like Paris to Mozambique after you know 18 years of civil war, all the infrastructure was this, uh, destroyed. There was you know, poverty, uh, you know, services were not working. So I remember landing in, in Maputo, and my first days in Maputo were uh, you know, a mix of emotions and then going to a rural area actually was in a little village that was totally destroyed uh, on the Zambezi River, that's in the central part near Beira where the, where, where, where the hurricane hit now, it's part of the same province. And, and that was even more challenging because I was in a village uh, for almost a year without uh, running water and electricity. Um, but it was very rewarding. It was a, you know, a village that had gone from government to resistance. And it was very humbling, very rewarding. I think going from a big city where you had all the uh, comfort to uh, a very humbling place where you were in daily contact with life and death and basic needs. Uh, you know, for me, I was 23 at that time. And I remember perhaps walking towards the village and seeing a child, you know, that was clearly dehydrated and you could see the eyes and coming back from the market and that child would have already died in his mother arms. So being 23 years old, being confronted with, you know, accidents at the time, you know, people will go and wash clothes in the river and there were crocodile attacks, hippopotamus attacks, landmines. So were there all type of hazards and when you take a kid uh, or a young student from uh, a city in the developed, uh, so-called developed world, and you place them at the other extreme, it's, it's a very humbling um, and at the same time rewarding because you, you, you feel that you have a duty, but also sometimes you are able to make a difference even by touching someone's life. Do you think that experience in Mozambique has shaped your way of looking at the world? And is that in any way the reason you have been staying uh, with the UN? Definitely, yes. I understood first it made me value what I had and the basic things I had. And when I say what I had, I'm not talking about material things. I'm about being able to have two legs, health, two eyes, and be able to, to carry on a life normally. Uh, and I remember saying just a few months ago I will get upset or stressed out of mundane things. Uh, and, and now how grateful I am just to be alive. And, and that was uh, very important. But then I also was my first contact with the UN and, and war or a post really the, the, the peace agreement was just signed. It was very fragile. There was a lot of tension and there were a few riots and, and and, and, and still a little bit of, of uh, violence. 
and, and try to understand this big machinery about the UN, but also the peacekeeping and all the mixed emotions. And, and that's why I think it made me perhaps uh, better prepared to understand some of the positions that today um, uh, people have in countries like Timor-Leste, where there was also a peacekeeping force and all the good but also the bad that comes with it. So I was, uh, of course, very much focused on making a difference um, at the local level and in, the, in that village called uh, Kaya. And, um, and I felt that, you know, you can always at a different level make a difference, even if you are a young 23, 24 year old and a volunteer. You have been staying with the UN for uh, quite a while. In your own personal view, what is the role of the UN in, in the, uh, the whole uh, development process of the world? Well, the, the, the UN does uh, different parts of it. You have, uh, of course, all the uh, peace and security apparatus. And we look at uh, the UN uh, main body, the secretariat located in, in, in New York and in Geneva. And uh, this was... Uh, something that came out of the ashes of the Second World War and in that sense uh, it plays I think an important role. It's the, the place where all the countries come together and sit at a table and discuss issues rather than uh, confront each other. Um, so I still believe very strongly in, in what the UN is about and, and I think the countries made a pledge after the Second World War to come together and have a, a mechanism to settle their differences and to have certain rules in which they will obey with, uh, to try to um, make the place a better, the world a better place to live. Um, and then you have also the specialized agencies and funds uh, like UNDP, and those, uh, those are the UN presence at the country level. And also, I think that there, there's a tremendous, for me, value um, and uh, I, I don't want to say need, but also value added for, for the countries. How the UN gives back to the, those countries. And, and it's not only in poor post-conflict. Uh, today we have significant uh, UN presence in middle income countries, even in high income countries. I started actually in the field in an oil producing high income country in, in, in the English speaking Caribbean. Uh, and there's always um, uh, an area of support. It could be, you know, reducing inequality. You find resource-rich countries like Timor-Leste usually have, uh, you know, tremendous uh, level of uh, income, but not necessarily uh, uh, a good distribution uh, of, of uh, the wealth. So some high-income countries ask us, listen, how we look at income distribution and poverty in a new way, not just economic poverty. How do we prepare ourselves? And this is now the challenges, and we have relevant programs in, in many countries in, in Asia and the Pacific, and countries are working with us, trying to understand how they can be better prepared to confront 21st century challenges, like artificial intelligence, technology, uh, the shared economy, what does this mean, you know, the Ubers, the Airbnbs of this world? How are those going to affect positively or negatively the current um, economy and the current development uh, of the country? So in that sense, the UN has presence in, in more than 160 countries and offices, for example, UNDP. And what we try to bring is the wealth of knowledge and experience accumulated over those 40 plus years of development in those countries, so countries like Timor-Leste can learn from what works, but also try to avoid the mistakes that other countries uh, have done and accelerate and scale up their efforts in trying to reach also uh, their own targets, like in the case of Timor-Leste, the strategic development plan. Since you're posting in Timor-Leste, what can you say about Timor-Leste? Well, uh, I think what impresses me to molest it perhaps is the thing that are difficult sometimes to capture or, or to talk about. First, the tremendous resilience that the country and the people have. I mean, this is a country that went through, uh, you know, years of years of first colonization and then an occupation and, uh, and how most of the Timorese that you 
are in touch on a day-to-day -day basis, they've been able uh, to move along and to um, embrace a peace, and, but also to come together in a reconciliation effort among yourselves, but also with your neighboring country, which is Indonesia. And, and, and that seems romantic or minor, but I think it's a tremendous asset, an intangible asset, a tremendous uh, asset to be able to move forward. You know, I always say there are some countries that spend years and years looking at the past. And, and I went through my own country after, you know, uh, 20 years of dictatorship, and I'm talking about Uruguay. There was a big debate in 1983 when the first uh, elected, uh, the first elections after the dictatorship, the military dictatorship happened. The big debate with the population is, should we go back and, 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 and judge all the militaries and the crimes um, uh, right now, and, and, and that, that divided the country. A lot of people says, well, we need to heal and move on. And a lot of country, and a lot of people in the population says, we, we, we need to move back. And, and I was a young student at that age, but that was a tremendous, I says, listen, there's a risk for a small country like us, and I relate to Timor Leste, of being stuck for 10 or 20 years in, in trials and processes and, and trying to look, look back. That's important also because people want justice, they want a respect for human rights, they want to make sure that there's reasonable insurances that this will not go unpunished and will not happen again in the future. But also you have to devote significant amounts of energy on, on countries that, particularly like Timor Leste, that are small and have limited opportunities, how you can move really, uh, really fast and together to try to uh, embrace development and, 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 and grow, not only economically, but grow as a nation. And what strikes me about Timor Leste is how, after a conflict, uh, peacekeeping, uh, you know, um, a country that was administered by the UN and a peacekeeping mission, you've been to move on really fast, because 15 years is just a few seconds. I'm coming to, from, in the past 10 years, I've been working in countries that have 200 years of you know, a republican history and a constitution. And here in 15, 17 years, you've, been managed, you, you've managed to do a lot in that sense, to come together as a people, uh, to develop institutions, and to have a functioning country that today is a sovereign country and, and, and does not depend from anyone else other than from yourselves to keep moving forward towards the future. Which places in Timor Leste have you been? Well, I visited most of the country. The only, I think, place I haven't been is uh, Vikeke, sadly, but um, um, I've been to, to pretty much uh, all the country. And I must say, it's a beautiful country for work reasons and personal reasons. You know, I, on weekends, I'm, I, I, I want to believe I'm very active, so I try to always go and, 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 and explore the country. Diplomats like yourselves are always busy and when uh, we hear about people like you, we always think busy work, meetings. So to close this conversation, how about family life, if you don't mind sharing with us? Well, I have a diplomatic status, but I don't see myself as a diplomat. I see myself as a development practitioner, a development worker, and, 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 and perhaps that's the fact I'm not wearing a tie. And, and in Timor Leste, I try to uh, relate to the counterparts and talk about the work. Um, I'm, I'm a family person, so, uh, and the secret to have a, a successful relationship and a family life is to invest in it and to take care of it. It's not like a broom that you put in the closet. So uh, I try to spend a lot of time. Uh, we uh, find a few moments. I come from a similar upbringing, like in Timor Leste. You know, we we, we are uh, from from. I grew up my, in, in in a Judeo-Christian. I'm not Jewish. My father is Christian, actually Orthodox Christian. But we enjoy the same things. You know, meals and and. And celebrations and, and, and family together. So we invest a lot. For example, we have a commitment to have breakfast every day together. My wife, my son, and I. So we have a fixed time, and, and we actually spend 
in a few minutes. It's not like in modern cities that we grab something to eat, a piece of bread, and we have breakfast walking out the door. No, we sit down at the table and we uh, enjoy that meal. So we wake up a little bit earlier, but we have breakfast together. I also try as much as I can, and that's one of the beautiful things about Dili and Timoleste, to have lunch also together with uh, my wife. My son is at school, but uh, we, we have lunch and we talk, we enjoy, and we try to spend uh, as much as we can dinner together. So those are the moments that are sure. You know? And on weekends, we, we try to enjoy the country together. The country has um, beautiful natural assets. You, know? you have beaches, you have mountains, uh, you have nature, things that perhaps today you don't value. But uh, uh, people uh, that live in big cities and only see cement do value. The first alive chicken I saw in my life, I was eight years old. And I don't remember the moment, but my family told me that I walked into the chicken fence and I was puzzled seeing all this chicken running around. So uh, for many people, it's a chicken. For me, I was used only to see a piece of meat in a plastic bag in the supermarket. So you have a lot of things, and these unexplored beaches and islands uh, like Atauro or Jaco, or even if you go a few minutes away from here, um, east or west, you know, and I'm thinking there's beautiful places, uh, Basartete, for example, is a few minutes away. If you go up to Basartete, it's cold, you're under huge trees, silence, the only thing you hear is birds and the noise of wind going through the branches. And, and that's a luxury that in today, most of the big cities you don't have. You, you have smog, uh, car noise, uh, stress. So that in itself, I value it. I lived in big cities. I enjoy it about the molest. Thank you for staying with us on Diplomata. I'm sitting here with Mr. Claudio at the Integrated Youth Hub called Knua Juventude Filaliman, one of the projects being supported by UNDP. So in this session of interview, I will be discussing with Mr. Claudio the work UNDP is doing in Timor-Leste. Apart from this project, what else uh, are you doing in Timor-Leste? Well, this is a very uh, small project that makes part of a larger uh, initiative, which is inclusive development. And uh, when we, the United Nations launches uh, five years uh, programming strategy with the government of Timor Leste in 2015, uh, we have you know a country program that spans five years. Um, at that time, the six. Uh, constitutional government was very much focused, like today, on economic diversification and uh, financing development or development finance. Uh, we started working on a few things uh, in that area, which was on industrial policy, looking at different models. I remember at that time the Ministry of Commerce um, and Industry uh, started looking at the industrial policy, social business, uh, how we could engage you. At the same time, uh, we had started uh, together with Flinders University and the, and, and the uh, presidency of the Councils of Ministers a research project on youth, a human development report. And what we start seeing um, that Timor Leste had is something that is very unique, uh, a very high youth bulge, it means proportions of youth, but also that those youth mainly wanted two things. They want several things, but two big things. One. Uh, more participation, and that's participation into the decision-making and the political process, uh, what we call voices, and the other ones, economic opportunities, jobs, which is linked again to economic uh, diversification. And traditionally, the, the, the banks focus on, on the upstream and macroeconomic policy and environment, but what we thought with UNDP is how we can provide a series of um, uh, initiatives making that, together with the government, improving the enabling environment for youth. Uh, some uh, comparative experiences, we start working on financial inclusion with the central bank. Uh, there's a couple of lo loan guarantees, how we reduce risk, but also setting up a one-stop shop center as an example of the type of things that Timor Leste could do to better cater to you. Other things that we do is environment. Together, again, we work 
uh, hand in hand with the government of Timor Leste, addressing climate change and, and reducing uh, the vulnerability to risks, droughts, floods. And Timor Leste has been very active uh, on that front, uh, looking at you know, climate change, uh, the sustainable environment, uh, coastal uh, management, biodiversity, how we protect, for example, infrastructure from climate change and erosion. So we have a very successful project or initiative in the Delay Narrow Corridor, um, uh, looking at, uh, you know, again, how we offset uh, the cost of maintenance for infrastructure. Um, and and uh, working on, again, with other agencies on, 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 on disasters. So basically, uh, what, what we do is very much focus on good governance, institutions and capacity development. Um, we develop uh, and uh, try to support institutions and institutional development in Timor Leste. We work on social poverty and economic diversification and environment. And within environment, again, uh, a small chapter on uh, natural uh, disasters. Within that, there's a series of initiatives which are planned with the government of Timor Leste, and most of what we do is within the government institutions, hand in hand with the government. We are very committed to uh, develop capacities and also to have an exit strategy so uh, the government of Timor Leste can take on these efforts. I've heard from a few people within the UN system uh, the term in inclusive development. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Inclusive so development, uh, I think Timor Leste has managed a few terms. For example, when I arrived at Google, it was very much social business. Uh, we work, uh, for example, in Arguzi, and the word that they use is social market economy. At the end, in our discussions in 2014 and 15 with the government, when we were developing our country strategy, it was very clear that, uh, and I think this is a, a, a generalized thing, uh, all the different constitutional governments, and I work with uh, three, seem to uh, be very clear that whatever investment, private sector initiative, they want some downstream impact, they want some social benefit, they want some social inclusion. For example, if you're doing any initiative, perhaps you could do it faster, cheaper or more efficient. Uh, but here, whatever you do, knowing that this is a nascent economy, um, the, the, the government seems very much committed and, and we agree to the principle to make sure that there's some downstream benefits at the community level uh, and has some social impact. For example, when you do infrastructure, can you involve better uh, the communities in some of the uh, work being done? We do water projects. How we involve the community in uh, the implementation of water initiative, as opposed to bringing a group of experts, from Italy or foreigners, to come and, and implement the project. So uh, that was uh, very clear from the start, and that's pretty much how we work all across of, uh, our initiatives. So we try as much as possible ourselves and we work with partners that they, there's a clear uh, social benefit and that there are projects that are sustainable and focus very much on inclusion. And that means inclusion of the Timorese population in the process but also in the benefits. Yeah. Who are your counterparts, your partners in your uh the, in the initiative, initiatives you are supporting or you're working on? Well, uh, we are not, you know, we don't work alone. We are not a contractor. We are a multilateral uh, uh, institution. We are an international organization. And uh, everything that we do is according, again, to a five year plan, a country strategy with the government and with the established institutions. So our, our typical counterparts can be you know, uh, uh, ministries most of the time, sometimes there, there is uh, in the implementations of projects, particularly at the community level uh, or the rural area, or even in Delhi with some uh, NGO, civil society, uh, but our main counterpart is institutions. Again, we're not focused alone on projects. Uh, what we're trying to do, develop here is bring experiences, um, uh, do research, policy advice, and in many cases, like here with Knua, Juventude, Fila, Liman, we have projects that have a pilot, there are pilots or a demonstrative effect, but uh, we do it in partnership with the government. This was launched, for example, with the Prime Minister's office, with the six constitutional government, 
in partnership with uh, Yade, Cefope, uh, BNCTL, Survey, uh, um, and Telemor, who uh, uh, graciously provides uh, internet access. One of the concerns that have been raised by uh, a number of groups and also people in terms of good governance is the fact that some of the services, a number of the services in Timor are still lacking the quality. Um, what is the UN doing in, in helping, you mentioned the government as a partner, um, UNDP in particular, are you doing something to, to help in that aspect? Because that being an, a new nation, that seems to be one of the challenges uh, facing Timor-Leste. Some very basic services to, to the populations um, throughout the country. Well, that, that's quite a broad question. So we, we're doing several things. First, we, we have ongoing discussions with the government and partners how to do better. Uh, doing better, we have to be mindful that the country is still committed to, uh, uh, and most of the economy being dominated by the public sector, to have a very large uh, presence of the public sector uh, in the delivery of those services. But in the meantime, you can do a few things. One is focus on, on education, which we are not directly involved, but we have asked the UN that discussion and we recommend it, for example, in our National Human Development Report, we make specific recommendations on uh, traditional education, but also what we call 21st century skills, like we do here in terms of skill development, uh, skills development uh, and perhaps a technical and vocational training. Uh, we try to work on modernization of uh, the public sector together again uh, with the government that supports those efforts. Something that we keep hearing more and more, in, at least in the last couple of years, um, at all levels of the government, how we can start change, changing behavior and, 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 and culture and the mindset of people, uh, recipients, but also of public servants. Uh, we've done that in UDP and, and, uh, and one of the things I think we're extremely proud as a team is that we, we, we have a very much uh, client service approach and we see everyone as a client, ourselves, uh, you know, contractors, government agencies, beneficiaries. And, and that requires a significant change in terms of mindset, but sometimes very little effort. And that can start uh, today. So we are having that discussion and this is part of it. So for example, how youth, instead of becoming job seekers, they become job creators or job makers. So that's a discussion also we have. And finally, we are looking, we are working very closely with the government and particularly with uh, Statal and a few of the municipal administrations. We have specifically a pilot with uh, Bacao, Babonaro, and also in Norcusi on how we, uh, within the centralization, we do a few things better. Now, for example, in partnership with the, the EU, we are looking on how we can establish one-stop shop service centers, so no just ciudadano or kiosks to go uh, at, at the municipal level. So while you have several uh, agencies or, or ministries, how you can do a few things better, looking at you know what are the priority services that those people uh, require. In terms of health of education, it's just uh, having better quality and targeted interventions, and that. It's, it's achievable. Uh, first, you need data, and this is a young country, and luckily we have, you know, the Ministry of Finance and Statistical Office is there, it keeps improving, but we still need a lot of data. And in our pilot, what we're doing right now with Statal is try to make sure that the development at the municipal level and at the super level is informed by needs, not just uh, by aspiration, but by, uh, uh, by needs looking at the broader area or territory. So it could be a, a series of sucos or the entire municipality. So data is very important. And then efficient and sustainable projects. Water. For example, we have many, many institutions are working on water and NGOs. What we find out sometimes is that many of these are not sustainable. So we work with uh, MSS and Statal. Uh, we have a very innovative approach for low-cost, high-impact uh, water solutions. Uh, our pilot has been along the Dilia Inaro corridor and, and for the past three days there's a government delegation visiting the results of those water 
systems, we can deliver water for 1,500 people for $50,000 in four to five months. Those are communal taps and gravity fed, and they're highly sustainable, and the community maintains them with their uh, 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 budgets. Uh, so those things can be done, and they're relatively cheap when you look at the level of resources. So that's something that we're not doing alone, we're doing it in partnership with the government. And we think that that needs to be scaled Do you find any or one of the projects working better than, um, better than the others? We had this year actually two evaluations, one from the overall uh, UNDP program, independent evaluations, and one specific to our governance portfolio. Uh, and we find, I mean, there were both, uh, one is called assessment of development results. What we find is clear trends, and, and this is no science or rocket science. Uh, I think most of development partners would agree, and, and government agencies on this. First, that development needs to be, like you very well said, inclusive, but inclusive from the design process. So what seems to work very well in Timor-Leste is when you involve uh, the counterparts and the communities from the start on the design, and there's an ownership of that process. In terms, it can be informed, it can be guided again by analysis, data, expertise, but you know, bringing things in a, in a, in a black box and landing them in, in a specific aldea, or village, or municipality, or even in Dili, does not work. You have to involve the beneficiaries, uh, the, the government counterparts in the design process. Then is joint financing. Even if it's, for example, our water projects, every, every community puts a few cents. We have what we call Grupo de Manutenção Local. And every community puts a few cents after we inaugurate the water solution and they have to maintain it. When, when people have to pay from their own pocket for something, they value a little bit more and they take care of things. So it's also involvement in the, in the implementation and in, 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 uh, in maintaining whatever we do. So that's, that's uh, very, very important. And in the case of the government, we see that in those projects where the government, and the government in Moleste is very responsible in that sense, uh, uh, working with us, when they really find that there's value, they are co-financing. So Timor Leste now is not only a recipient, it has moved away from the peacekeeping area where it was a recipient of development funds. Now many donors have moved away. And now Timor Leste is the major donor of development, the major financer of its own development, uh, is, is uh, the, uh, the government of, of Timor Leste. So we make sure that there is a resharing equation and there's a lot of ownership. What are the challenges you are facing in, in uh, carrying out uh, the projects, the, 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 the work you are doing? Challenges right now, uh, we, we, we would wish that, uh, well, we, we have a challenge, of, of course, uh, of uh, the, the, the impasse uh, during the seven uh, transition to the eight um, constitutional government. That was, for me, a, a, a year and a half almost of uh, development. Uh, time lost, opportunity lost. You know, we, we were working uh, very well, and that was a year because of the Duodecimus regime that not much has happened. And that I said because I'm someone that comes from a developing country, worked a lot in different developing countries, and I tend to be impatient. I say if we managed to put a man on the moon 50 years ago, why we cannot deliver uh, more water to Laute, Manufati, or Vikeke? Those are things that are achievable within few months, a few years. So that, that was a challenge, but that's uh, a very specific item. The, the one uh, that is still a challenge in Timor-Leste is human resource skills. And I think that's something that requires from this government, past governments and future governments a lot of attention. A, a lot of attention. The, the, the education is key. Uh, uh, the primary, secondary, and it's not just building schools. It's uh, the quality of education, measuring uh, educational outcomes. So uh, educating uh, uh, for skills. So we believe that increased investments on education are key uh, for Timor-Leste, and that goes hands in hands uh, with skills. Diversification of the economy. We, we are 
uh, quite concerned, as is the government, it's, it's no secret, on how we diversify the economy and we look at different sources of financing for development. Uh, not everything can be, you know, the petroleum fund and the public sector. So how uh, we, we support the government's efforts in increasing the different sources of financing between blending, you know, between concessional loans, grants, domestic, uh, uh, foreign. Uh, so how we, we, we all together as development partners help the government in, in those efforts. If not, there's tremendous risk because you have a growing population of young people that are unemployed or non, do not have meaningful employment. Um, and how you achieve that target, which is quite ambitious, of uh, providing those 60,000 jobs that uh, were promised. Uh, we, we estimate at least 16 or 17 are needed every year with the population growth. You have shared a lot of very uh, good information on the work uh, UNDP is doing and certainly uh, there's a lot of work to do um, ahead so we would like to wish you all the best with your work and we'll see you um, another another time when we we see you again thank you very much hello and thank you for joining the program could you please share with us what you do in your work every day? First of all, uh, my name is Luciano Freitas. I'm the head of human resources in UNDP. Uh, basically, my role in the, as uh, head of human resources, we are uh, managing the recruitment uh, to fill up all the uh, vacant positions that are required by project and the units, and as well as manage the staff contract and staff benefit entitlement. Um, what is the role of Mr. Claudio in your work? Okay. Um, Mr. Claudio, as the head of UNDP, uh, he is the country director for UNDP. Um, he is as uh, how is top management in our uh, in our organization. Uh, he approves uh, all the recruitment process for us that uh, we are managing. And he also has, uh, how do you say, uh, position to not approve all the recruitment process that we did. We did, basically, uh, if it's not follow our internal uh, rules and regulation. Uh, as uh, human resources, which is part of the operation unit, we are supporting to del to uh, project uh, delivery as well as the country office delivery through our, uh, how do you say, speed of the recruitment process to uh, follow the needs of the project and the unit of the uh, fill up the position. And what, it is, what is it like to work with Mr. Claudio? Claudio is uh, uh, a good person. Uh, he has a friendly staff uh, and as well as he is um, full of humors. Uh, when we had a meeting, he always make a humors to uh, how does he close the how do you say boring uh, things? So he always make up uh, humors to you know to cover up all these issues. But the the important thing that I noticed from him is that as a head of UNDP, he is uh, he has like uh, um, how do you say um, a low profile style. Uh, he is not uh, a person that not easy to meet, but he always meet at any time any any question that if you want to have uh, discuss with him and he is also very supportive uh, and as well as good supervisor he motivates staff and he encourages staff to improve uh, career uh, and he al also would like to how to say <coughs> uh, move uh, push the staff that provide uh, uh, outstanding performance first of all what is your position and what do you do in that capacity? Well, I'm currently uh, the operation manager of UNDP. So under the current structure of UNDP, after the resident representative, it's the operation manager. And, then, and for this position, I manage all the support uh, in terms of operational support that we um, we provide to the implementation of our programs and projects uh, in Timor-Leste 
And in addition to that, um, because UNDP is the leading agency in managing the common services of the UN system in Timor-Leste, um, I also uh, lead the, uh, the services of um, uh, supports to the common services in, in, the, in the UN, UN country team in Timor-Leste. And uh, in addition to that, um, because of the, my role, um, I also support the program unit, the program colleagues in monitoring the implementation of um, our program and projects. In which project are you involved directly with at the moment? Okay. Um, because of my role, the program is not my main uh, 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 work, but I am currently involved in the implementation of the, the Parliament project. Uh, we recently signed an agreement with the Parliament to support the justice system reform. So um, I was involved in the resource mobilization and now in the implementation of the project, the first phase of the project. And also the other pro initiative that I'm involved which I'm leading at the moment is the Accelerator Labs. This is like, for, this is, uh, we got a fund from UNDP Global to come up with initiatives in terms, in terms of um, uh, developing new programs and projects for, in, uh, for, 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 for UNDP Timor-Leste. So what is the role of Mr. Claudio in your work? Okay, Claudio is currently the number one person in UNDP and uh, he basically uh, he is basically responsible for, for the whole management of UNDP's operation in Timor-Leste. So and then as I mentioned before, um, under the current structure, the operation manager is uh, directly supervised by, um, by, by resident representatives. So Claudio, uh, in principle, um, make decisions and, and um, make at, at, the, at, at the maximum level. That's his 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 um, his, um, his his his, uh, his role. But he, under Claudio, it's, it's me. So basically. Um, he will consult with you know consult uh, with me uh, for before he make decision. I mean, mean, mean minutes before he make decision. Basically, because I'm, I'm in charge of the operation, okay, operation support to to, to to our projects, and I report to Claudio. So in I report to Claudio in uh, in, in, in many in, in basically in everything. So that comes from Claudio's role. As the second person within the, this office, what is it like to work with uh, Mr. Claudio? Okay, well everyone can be a manager, can be a leader, um, but not everyone can manage well or can, be, can lead well. And Claudio, Claudio is a, a unique manager, he is very, like, he is very supportive to his, uh, his supervisors and his staff and um, the, main, the main thing that I like from Claudio is the trust that he gives to uh, his, uh, his, uh, his supervisor and his, all his staff and he will not, he, he listens too. What do you do within the UNDP office in Timor-Leste? Well, my, I work as program manager for UNDP overseeing uh, environment and sustainable development program. I work um, closely with Mr. Claudio Providas, um, the UNDP resident representative. Um, because of Mr. Claudio's leaderships and his support of youth entrepreneurships and innovations, um, that's why we were able to establish Kunua Juventudi Filaliman. Um, it's a one-stop shop youth hub for youth innovation and entrepreneurships, providing an integrated empowerment services to youth to transform uh, youth from being job seekers to become job creators, because youth have the power to create jobs for themselves and for other people. And at Kunua, we have uh, provided empowerment services, skills development, to around 5,000 youth out of which 
um, 30 are now entrepreneurs and 30 are now employed. And we have some youth who are now starting um, their recycling projects, transforming waste into new products that is valuable, um, like uh, plastic waste into jewelry or plastic uh, waste into um, recycling uh, sofas or chairs. What is your role in this Canoe and Juventude? Um, I'm the program manager. I work in this um, concept, start from the beginning, uh, starting uh, with the research and consultations with um, development partners, including the government, uh, and discuss with them to establish partnerships. So we started with the Secretary of State for vocational training and uh, uh, vocational, vocational training, CEPOPE, and then Secretary of State for Youth and Sport, uh, with Serve, with IADE, and Telemore. That's the five partners that we work with at the beginning. And we also work, work with the Office of the Prime Minister of the Sixth Constitutional Government, um, His Excellency Rui Arazu, who was the one who inaugurated CNUA in August 2017. Um, and after the establishment of CNUA, my role is to provide um, supervision, quality assurance, as well as um, managing CNUA and also other projects. Um, so I ensure I'm not based here at CNUA, I'm based at UNDP, but I come here only um, sometimes to meet with the youth and for events. But uh, daily, manage, daily management of CNUA is uh, uh, of, uh, by the project coordinator. Um, but my role is to make sure that activities that are conducted here are based on the approved project document that is approved by our um, UNDP regional office in Bangkok. And it's also the activities that we conducted here deliver results. So it's not just activity, we um, ensure, my role is to ensure that the activities that we uh, provided to the youth actually benefited them and that they create job for themselves. You mentioned 5,000 youth that have been coming through the, the Knoa Juventude. Where are they now? Okay, um, there are a lot of youth, like 5,000. 5, Some of them are university students. They come here um, every day, almost every day, especially lunchtime, they come here to access internet because Telemore providing internet, free internet access uh, to youth from Knoa. So we have this um, space here that is dedicated for youth to come here to do their assignments, to do online research uh, by using the free internet access here. And other youth came here uh, to participate in our social business camp. The social business camp is specifically to introduce to the youth the concept of social business. And this uh, starting by identifying a problem in their communities and transform that problem into a business idea. And our team here train them on how to develop that business idea, develop their business plan, and once they are ready, we support them to register their business in survey. And others who actually cannot start their business because of lack of capital or they need funding, they need financial to start their business, we advise them to start small, but if they need um, you know, to take loans from the from the bank or from the credit guarantee, we link them to the bank because we have um, uh, an OMU with BNCTL. But since uh, the start of Knoa Juventudi, uh, none of our youth actually access um, credit from the bank because the interest fee is actually very high. So what those who are already started, they started with their own uh, resources with small money that they have and they started small and building it slowly. Back to Mr. Claudio. How is it to work with him, to work with a UN dipl diplomat like Mr. Claudio? Um, Mr. Claudio is very supportive of uh, the staff. I work with him almost every day. We work in the same room um, and every day, every week, uh, we have the program meeting uh, with him. Uh, it's a coordination meeting between uh, program uh, officers, because not only myself, uh, I'm overseeing environment and sustainable development. We have colleagues who oversee governance uh, sector and another colleagues who oversee resilience building sectors and also the operation manager. So every week we meet with uh, Mr. Claudio uh, to plan for, for the week and to um, uh, implement the activities of, 
of uh, UNDP. Mr. Claudio, um, especially he's very passionate about youth empowerment and innovation. Um, and that's why Kunwaljo Venturi is one of the priority areas of UNDP because um, he really see uh, the youth of Timor Leste are not, um, you know, are not travel makers. Youth of Timor Leste have the potential um, to, to grow, the potential to create jobs. What they need is facilities that co that com can give them access to everything: skills development, uh, online research, um, innovation lab. That for them to explore, to try out, to create something. Um, that is why recently KNU established in 2017, but only recently last month we established a 3D innovation lab. Um, it's a 3D uh, printer uh, for you to learn how to how to do design um, 3D design, how to do um, coding, and how to um, develop their prototype of pro projects to solve an, um, a community problem. So what I like about Mr. Claudio, his you know, this, his patience of innovation and entrepreneurship. Because other countries, you know, they're developed countries. Innovations, 3D innovation lab are not new in other countries. But in Timor-Leste, this is something new. And it's because of Mount Claudio's supportive of youth innovation and entrepreneurship, we are able to bring this, um, you know, technology to Timor-Leste, to Knua, that youth were able to you know, um, try out, are able to learn and make things. That's, I think that's the most important things, um, the things that I really like working with Mount Claudio. Um, he's also very supportive of his staff. He gives the opportunity for us to um, pilot things, like Nua was a pilot, you know, we just developed the, the concept. He trusts us. To, to try, to develop new concepts, new ideas, and he trusts us. And because of his trust, we are able to you know, have this youth as access to technology and to the Fila Lima. Not only that, uh, he's also very supportive of other UNDP um, uh, program, like the Okusi Business Incubations. It's also one of the program that was supported by Mr. Claudio. Um, other program, like the recent um, Zero Plastic Policy, um, that we are supporting the, the Secretary of State for Environment. It's, it's because of Mr. Claudius' uh, support to the government of Timor-Leste that he is, he is approving UNDP, us to use UNDP resources to support the government of Timor-Leste. These are just some of the examples of Mr. Claudius. The development of Timor-Leste requires a lot of hard work. UNDP, with no doubt, will be standing beside this country to work and also to help in that process. My conversations with Mr. Claudio and some of his team members has given us an idea on what UNDP is doing and what it can do to help Timor-Leste advance. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed the program. See you on the next episode of Diplomata. I'm Francis Suni. Bye for now.